Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sylvia Schwag Serger. I'm uh, the relatively newly appointed uh, president of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this seminar this afternoon with um, a Nobel Prize laureate in phys physics, Professor Jeffrey Hinton. Welcome. Uh, we already, I had the privilege of having a short conversation with him before, and, and, I, and I think you're in for a very interesting hour, I hope so. So, um, I just wanted to say a few words before I ask Professor Hinton to take the stage and say some, uh, also make an opening, uh, some opening uh, words. Um, so, I am a professor of economic history, and as a professor of economic history, I study, I have studied um, technological shifts. Um, and AI as a partial an extension of digitalization, but it is definitely one of these large technology, sh technology shifts in human history. And when we're dealing with technology shifts, that has a lot of consequences. And I would also argue when these technology shifts um, coincide with, for example, an escalating climate crisis, with the rise of geopolitical tensions and the erosion of democracy, then you approach something that on a bad day I might call a toxic cocktail. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about how we will handle what we're dealing with today in a constructive, a proactive, and a successful way. If you allow me, I'd just like to say a few words about the Swedish government's AI commission, of which I was a member. Um, we spent the last nine months uh, preparing a report, talking to hundreds of people, and last week we delivered our report to the Swedish government. This report, like reports in many other countries, has some similarities with other countries' AI strategies. It tries to make proposals about how to increase computing power, how to boost science, how to contribute to innovation and competitiveness. But there are also some aspects in the AI Commission report which I think are slightly different from many other countries' AI strategies or AI Commission reports. And those are, um, the first one is our ambition, which I hope comes through in the report, is to give people and the, the population in Sweden agency over this technology. This was a big emphasis in our report. Um, and it is very much in line with the message of the Nobel Prize laureates in economics this year, which talks about inclusive institution to, institutions to harness the forces, of, the forces of technology for good. It is also, and that's the second area where I think it dif differs a little bit from other countries' approaches or ambitions in AI, it has a very strong message and proposals on how we can strengthen the public sector to deliver better public service, and how the public sector can al actually also contribute to being a driver of AI, not just a late adopter. So I think those two things sort of set Sweden apart, I would argue, from maybe the way some other countries are approaching AI. And as I said, it is very much in line, I would argue, with the messages that we have from the Nobel Prize winners for economics. However, and this is something that keeps me awake at night, if we believe that uh, people's um, agency or the, uh, the people's agency over technology um, and inclusive institutions are important in order to ensure positive technological, the, the development of technology for good. Um, what do we do when we have the rise of governments and leaders, world leaders, who don't believe in institutions? Partially, perhaps, they don't believe in institutions because these institutions have not been as inclusive as they should have been. So I think that's one thing we have to think about. But it is a problem, which I think we're witnessing today, is the erosion, not just of democracy, but with it, the, the erosion of the belief in institutions. Secondly, what do we do in a world where we've witnessed a decline in the belief in international collaboration? Since I think both international collaboration and inclusive institutions will be critical for our ability to ensure that AI can realize its potential to be a force for good. 
And thirdly, and I think Professor Hinton has talked about this in many occasions when he speaks about the risks of AI and the importance of regulation, what do we do when governments don't really believe in regulation? And my personal question or concern is, and I will leave you with that, and then I really look forward to uh, Professor Hinton's remarks. What should a country like Sweden, a small open economy, highly de dependent on international trade, international collaboration, and a functioning world order do in a world when not everybody believes in international collaboration or acts in favor of international collaboration and regulation? What should the EU, what should Europe do in terms of regulating AI, not just to contain its risks, but to enable its potential? And with that, I would like to welcome Professor Hinton to give his opening remarks. So I guess I'd like to make one comment about what Sylvia just said, which is some um, politicians don't believe in institutions because if those institutions have functioned properly, they'd already be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to mention any names. Um, so I've got 10 minutes, and I wanted to basically say one thing. Um, if you take a problem like climate change, the first thing you have to do is convince people that carbon dioxide produced by people is what's causing climate change. Until you've done that, you can't have a sensible policy. Even after you've done that, you may not get a sensible policy. People may still subsidize oil companies and things, but that's a first step. Now, I've been talking about the existential threat of AI. This is a longer-term threat. There's many, many short-term threats which are urgent, like cyber attacks and loss of jobs and pandemics, and they go on and on, fake videos. Um, but there's this longer-term existential threat that we will create things more intelligent than ourselves, and they will take over. Um, many people don't take that seriously, and one of the reasons they don't take that seriously is because they don't think that the current AI systems we have really understand. So there's a group of people, many of them linguists influenced by Chomsky, um, who, think, who call these things stochastic parrots. And they think these things are just a statistical trick that takes a big body of text and just pastiches things together and looks like it understands, but doesn't really understand the way we do. Now, to have that theory that they don't understand the way we do, you have to have a theory of how we understand. Um, I'm going to argue they understand just like we do. So the people who talk about stochastic parrots, um, they have a theory of understanding that comes from classical symbolic AI, that in your head you have symbolic expressions in some cleaned up language, and you use symbolic rules to manipulate them. That theory never really worked. Um, but they still stick to it because they think, somehow they think the only way you could have intelligence is by having something like logic to do reasoning with. And they think the essence of intelligence is reasoning. There's a completely different paradigm, which is the essence of intelligence is learning, and it's learning in a neural net. And things like vision and motor control are primary, and language and reasoning comes later. Um, but I want to address this issue of, do they really understand? And there's one particular piece of history that most people don't know, which is these large language models, which certainly appear to understand and can answer any question you ask them at the level of a not very good expert, um, they came a long time ago. I like to think like this. Um, they came from a model I did in 1985, which was the first neural net language model. Um, it had 104 training examples instead of a trillion. Um, <laughs> or many billions. It had a, about a thousand weights in the network instead of a trillion. Um, but it was a language model that was trained to predict the next word and to backpropagate errors from the prediction in order to convert input symbols into vectors of neural activity and then learn how those vectors should interact to predict the vector for the symbol it was trying to predict. Um, now, the point of that was not, it didn't have an engineering point. The point of it was a theory of how people could understand the meanings of words. 
Um, so, the best model we have of how people understand sentences is these language models. That's the only model we have of how people do it that actually works. We have all these symbolic models. Um, they don't really work very well. They came, I mean, they're influenced strongly by Chomsky, who managed to convince many generations of linguists that language is not learned. On the face of it, it's just obviously absurd to say language isn't learned. And if you can get people to believe something obviously absurd, then you've got a cult. <laughs> um, and Chomsky's had a cult. Um, language is learned, and we now can see things that learn language. The structure doesn't have to be innate, it comes from data. There has to be innate structure in the neural network and in the learning algorithm, but all the structure of language you can just get from data. Chomsky couldn't see how to do that, so he said it must be innate. Actually, saying it must be innate and it's not learned is really stupid, because that's saying evolution learned it rather than learning, and evolution is a much slower process than learning. The reason evolution produced brains is so you could learn stuff faster than evolution can make it innate. So the point of this ramble was to convince you that um, they understand the same way we do. And I'll give you one more piece of evidence for that. So many people who talk about stochastic parrots say, look, I can show you they don't really understand because they just hallucinate stuff. They just make stuff up. Those people are not psychologists. They don't understand that they shouldn't use the word hallucinate. They should use the word confabulate. And psychologists since the 1930s have been studying human confabulation. A psychologist called Bartlett. Um, and people confabulate all the time. If you take any event that happened a long time ago and that you haven't rehearsed in the meantime, and you try and remember it, you will confidently remember all sorts of things that are wrong because memory doesn't consist of getting a file out of somewhere. Memory consists of constructing something that seems plausible. Now, if you've just seen something, and now you try and construct something that seems plausible, you'll have fairly accurate details. But if you saw it many years ago, and you now try and construct something that seems plausible, first of all, it'll be influenced by all the stuff you learned in the meantime. Um, and you'll construct something that sounds good to you, but actually, many of the details that you're very confident about will be just wrong. It's hard to show that, but there's one case studied by a psychologist called Ulrich Neisser, which is beautiful. John Dean testified at Watergate under oath about the cover-up going on in the Oval Room, or the Oval <coughs> Office, and he didn't know there were tapes. So you've got someone trying to tell the truth about things that happened a few years ago, and much of what he said was not true but he was clearly trying to tell the truth. He'd say, there was this meeting between these people. No, those people never had a meeting. And this person said this. No, that person didn't say that. Somebody else said that in a different meeting. But the point is, he was conveying the truth about the cover-up, and he was confident that what he was saying was true, and he was just wrong. And that's just the way human memory works. And so when these things confabulate, um, they're just like people. People confabulate. At least I think they do. I just made that up. <laughs> okay, I'm done. We won't <laughs> Jeffrey, if you could uh, stay here, because then oh. I think there's. A, I just wanted okay. to ask you, if I can, one or two questions. And I know then we have an excellent panel, which will speak to you a lot more about the technology. Um, but I know that you've talked about um, risks uh, with AI. Um, and so I really have to, just uh, the question about, uh, I think you've also talked about that there has to be some form of international collaboration to handle the risks. Um, would you like to, what do you think has to happen in order for countries to be able to collaborate in a constructive way to contain those risks? So I think on risks like lethal autonomous weapons, countries will not collaborate. The Russians and the Americans are not going to collaborate on battle robots that are going to fight each other. Um, all of the major countries that supply arms, Russia, the United States, China, Britain, Israel, and possibly Sweden, are busy making autonomous lethal weapons and they're not going to be slowed down, they're not going to regulate themselves, and they're not going to collaborate. If you look at the European regulations, there's a clause in the European regulations on AI that says none of these regulations apply to military uses of AI. Mm -hmm. 
So clearly the European countries don't want to regulate it. They want to get on and see if they can be build better battle robots than the other guys. And so we're not going to be able to control that. I think it's going to be the same for many of the other short-term risks. In the States, for example, they're not going to regulate fake videos because one of the parties that's soon to be in, totally in power believes in them. Um, so <laughs> there's one area, though, where you will get collaboration, and that's the existential threat. So the existential threat that when these things are smarter than us, which almost all the researchers I know believe they will be, we just differ on how soon, whether it's like in five years or in 30 years. Um, when they're smarter than us, will they take over? And is there anything we can do to prevent that happening since we make them? We will get collaboration on that because all of the countries don't want that to happen. And at the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States could collaborate on preventing a nuclear war. And they'll collaborate the same way on preventing these things taking over. The Chinese Communist Party does not want to lose power to um, AI. They want to hold on to it. Um, so I think that's an area where we can expect to get collaboration, mm. um, which is kind of lucky. But I think these other areas, we won't get collaboration. All right. Well, that's a somewhat optimistic. Yeah. And, then, and then my final question, as the Academy of Engineering Sciences, where we focus on solving problems, um, I would just like to ask you, what would you tell, and also as the mother of children who are quite concerned about the present and the future right now, what would you tell young people today? What would you want to... Okay, so there's some AI researchers, like Yalika, who's a friend of mine, and was my postdoc, um, who say there's no chance of them taking over, nothing to worry about. Um, don't believe that. Um, we don't know what's going to happen when they're smarter than us. Um, it's totally uncharted territory. There's other AI researchers, like Yudakovsky, well, he's not really an AI researcher, but he he's, knows a lot about AI, who say 99% chance they're going to take over. He actually says 999 and the correct strategy is to bomb the data centers now. Um, which wasn't very popular with the big companies. Um, that's crazy too. We're entering this era of huge uncertainty when we start dealing with things as intelligent or more intelligent than us. We have no idea what's going to happen. We're building them, so we have a lot of power at present. Um, we just don't know what's going to happen. People are very ingenious. Um, it's quite possible we'll figure out a way to make them so they never want to take control. Because if they ever wanted to take control, I think they easily could if they're smarter than us. So I think the situation we're in now is like someone who has a very cute tiger cub. And it's, a tiger cub makes a great pet, but you better be sure that when it's grown up, it never wants to kill you. If you can be sure of that, it's fine. Um, that's the situation we're in. Thank you so much. <laughs> On that note, I will leave you in the hands, uh, in the very competent hands of Annette Novak, who will guide us through this panel discussion. Thank you so much for so far. Thank you. Thank you.